Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let's do some problems on uh, quotients and um, homomorphisms and so on. So uh, recall, so problem 1, so recall the following uh, definition, M and R module is said to be cyclic. So we call M a cyclic module if uh, it is generated by a single element. So there exists a single X in M such that uh, M is just the submodule generated by X. In other words, it is all multiples of x, scalar multiples of x, r x are coming from r. So, if this happens, then we call m cyclic or singly generated. Okay, so, here is the question problem, prove that a cyclic r module, a cyclic r module is isomorphic to to a special module R mod i, the quotient, the quotient module R mod i, uh, where i is a left ideal, where i is some left ideal. Okay, um, let us prove this proof. So, firstly, let us ensure we understand the definitions here. Uh, recall that if you have a left ideal of R, then you can think of it. So, firstly, R can be thought of as a left module over itself. Uh, How is this? By sort of left multiplication. In other words, I take a scalar R in R. I think of the module also as being R itself. So, let us suppose I have X in R. Then how does R act on X? Well, the scalar multiplication is just the usual multiplication in the ring R. Okay. So, R is a left module over itself and what are the submodules for this module? They are exactly what we call the left ideals. So, the submodules of R under the left action are just the left ideals. Okay. Left ideals just mean they are a additive subgroup and if you multiply them on the left by any element of the ring, then it still belongs to the same uh, left ideal. Okay, submodules are the same as left ideals and uh, what we therefore can do, you have a module R, you have a submodule which is a left ideal um, and you can therefore take their quotient. So, what is being asked to prove is that uh, if I take every possible left ideal of R, consider the quotient r mod i, this collection uh, exhausts the possible cyclic r modules um, up to isomorphism. Okay, every cyclic r module is isomorphic to a module of the form r mod i. So, let us prove this. Um, so, what, what did we say a cyclic module was? So, so, the best way to prove this really is to set up a homomorphism. So, what, what do we have? We have a module M which is known to be cyclic, uh, which means there is a single generator X. Okay? Now, let us do the following. Let us define a map from R to M. Let us call this map phi. What does this map do? To each element R of the ring, it associates the element Rx. Okay? So, recall X is the fixed uh, generator of M. So, define this map R going to Rx. So, the first uh, thing to observe is that this map is actually, uh, so both sides R and M are R modules. Uh, this is a module homomorphism. This is a um, homomorphism of R modules. Okay, let us verify the properties. We need to check on the one hand that if I take a sum of two elements on the left, well, what does that give me? It is r plus x times x. But the fact that m is an r module means I have this distributive property. It is rx plus sx and therefore, that is just phi r plus phi s. Okay, so, that is one. 
we need to check that if I take uh, phi of, um, so I take an element of r and multiply it on the left by something, right. So, I need to now take, uh, let us give this a name. So, I take an element r of the ring and suppose I multiply it on the left by r dash. Okay. So, I want this answer to be, so let us write down what we want. So, this is the second property of being a module homomorphism that if I hit a module element on the left by r dash, the r dash should be, I should be able to pull it out. Okay. I want this to be true for all r, r dash and r. Okay. This is slightly confusing because the ring is also a module now in this case over itself, but uh, you should convince yourself that this is exactly the um, second axiom of uh, a homomorphism. Okay. Now, uh, let us check that this is true. So, phi of r dash r. So, let us compute the left hand side. So, what is this? Uh, by definition, this is r dash r acting on x. Now, uh, let us do the right hand side. This is r dash acting on phi of r. Phi of r is r x. Okay. But observe that these two are actually equal to each other because of the module axiom because m is a r module because m is an r module. So, the r module axiom says when I have a product of two scalars r prime and r, uh, when that acts on a on an element of the module, I, I can think of it as a two repeated actions. Right? First apply the first scalar, then apply the second scalar. Okay, so, what we actually have is that this map phi that we have defined is a homomorphism. Okay, now, what, what else can we conclude about this? So, first property of phi, phi is a R module homomorphism. Second property, phi is on 2. Why is that? Because m was given to be cyclic. We were given this property. Right, that every element of m is of the form r times x for some r. x is the fixed element remember. Okay, so, the, the fact that, so this is since m is cyclic. Okay, so, now we are in good shape because we can sort of apply the first isomorphism theorem which says that uh, when I have an, uh, um, a homomorphism then r modulo the kernel of this map is isomorphic to the image of this map. Okay. Now, in this case, uh, what is the image? The image is m and let us call the kernel as i. So, what is the kernel in general? Remember, if I have a homomorphism between two modules, the kernel is always a sub module. Okay. So, let us let us call uh, this fellow as i. So, let i be the kernel of this map. Then that is no, you know, we, all, we already know it is a sub module, sub module of R, but sub module remember it is the same as left ideal. Okay. So, it says R modulo the kernel is actually isomorphic to M and that is exactly what we needed to prove. Okay. So, we just had to realize that sub modules are the same as left ideals, i.e., uh, left ideal, i is. Uh, left hand. Okay. Um, in fact, this uh, this this ideal we we have actually proved a little more. We have said what was i. So we said r mod i is isomorphic to m, where i is exactly the kernel of the map. The kernel of what map? The map which sends each element r to r x. Okay. So which means what? This is exactly the set of all r in r such that r x is zero. Right, and this is usually, I mean, this has a name. This is usually called the annihilator in R of X. Okay, it's all elements, all scalars which annihilate that element X. So R modulo the annihilator of X is isomorphic to R X. So this is sometimes uh, another form in which you will see this. R modulo the annihilator is isomorphic to the submodule generated by that element X. Okay, so, all this I mean this is assuming that x is inside some module. In this case, we have we have assumed that rx itself is m. Okay, so, let us move on to the second problem. So, again is about quotients and, and sub modules. In fact, it is about 
uh, submodules of quotients. So, here is the problem uh, broadly speaking. So, suppose I have a module m, m is an R module, again R is not necessarily commutative and suppose I have a sub module n sub of m. Okay. So, um, recall that means that I have the quotient m mod n and in fact, I have a quotient map from m to m mod n. Okay. So, this double arrow just means that this map is surjection, it is a surjection. So, what does this map do? It takes uh, each element x of m and maps it to the cosette x plus m. Okay. So, this is this this is the uh, this map is uh, it is an R module homomorphism, it is a surjection. Pi is an R module homomorphism, pi is on to is sometimes called the quotient map. Okay, so, so the problem is the following, uh, determine what the submodules of m mod n look like. Okay, so, prove that the submodules of this module m mod n are in one to one correspondence, they are in bijection, show that there is a bijection between the submodules of m mod n and the submodules of m which contain n. Okay. So, uh, sometimes it is nice to draw a picture. So, I have m the ambient module, I have n the submodule and what we are saying here is that to understand the quotient m mod n or understand the, the submodules of the quotient, it is the same as understanding what are the submodules of m which lie between m and n. So, these p's you know th there could be several of them, these different submodules which lie between m and n, uh, e to each of them there corresponds a submodule of m mod n. Okay, so, this is an equivalent way of thinking about submodules of the quotient. Okay, so, let us just set up the, um, the bijection itself. So, proving it is, is easy. So, let me just tell you what, what the bijection is here. So, here is the bijection. Um, so, on one side let us write down the sub modules of m mod n and on the other side let us take the collection of all sub modules of m which contain n. Okay, so, I want to establish a bijection between these two. So, I will give you maps in both directions. So, uh, here is the first thing. Suppose I have a submodule. So, let us go in the forward direction. If I have a submodule of m modulo n, then here is what I can do. Uh, so, let for the moment just uh, go back to the quotient map. So, the quotient map is a map from m to m mod n. So, what I could do is um, the following. So, let us just move this. Uh, okay, let us move this down. Now, um, look at the uh, submodule here. So, let us take. Uh, so, suppose I have a submodule of m mod n. Okay, so, that is something which lives on this side, b is a sub of m by n. Now, what I can do is I, I have this map pi, I can look at its inverse image under pi. Okay, inverse image just means, I mean pi is not a 1 to 1 onto, I mean it is an onto map, not a 1 to 1 map, but inverse image just means I take all the elements. So, if b looks like this, okay, here is the ambient module m by n, here is the ambient module m. The inverse image of B just means I take all elements of M uh, which map to B, right? The pre images of all elements of B. So that is going to be my map. So this, this pre image is what is usually denoted as pi inverse B. So to each B, let us associate. So if this is my B, then to B, I associate 
its inverse image under the projection map okay, by which I mean take all elements of m uh, such that pi of x belongs to b. Okay. Uh, it is easy to check that this is a sub module of m and uh, it contains n necessarily because uh, observe that b is a sub module of m mod n. So, b must have the 0 element of m mod n. Okay. So, the first observation to make here is that this map is well defined. So, let us just record this somewhere. So, observe the inverse image of b um, is, is a sub module of m that is easy to check I believe that for you to verify, but the key prop property that we need is because uh, b contains the 0 element, uh, the, the pre image of the 0 element which is well what is the pre image of the 0 element? It is all elements of m whose cosets give you the 0 coset and that is of course, n by definition. Okay. So, the, the inverse image of the 0 coset is n. So, n is certainly contained in every pi inverse b. So, therefore, pi inverse b is a sub module of m which contains n that bit is fine. So, now let us define a map in the other direction. So, suppose I give you a sub module p of m which contains n then this map is just pi of p. So, I just map this to all the uh, cosets. So, I, I define take p and I just map it to its image under pi by which I mean all cosets uh, Okay. So, these are the two maps and I claim that uh, you know these two maps are inverses of each other that they, they give you the bijection that you want okay. um, or equivalently you could say that you know you can take any one of the two maps let us say the red map and show that it is a 1 to 1 and on to. Okay. So, I mean the verification itself is very easy and I hope you can you can do it. So, let me just do one of them. Uh, so, let us check for example, that uh, the red map is 1 to 1. So, I claim that uh, so, I mean here is one way of proceeding you prove that this this red map is both 1 to 1 and on to show both its properties. So, let us check that this map is 1 to 1 uh, or, or on to whichever is. So, let me do one of them let me show it is 1 to 1 maybe you can show it is on to. Um, uh, okay. So, to show it is 1 to 1 what do we need I need to take two different elements b 1 and b 2. Uh, two sub modules of m mod n and show if they are distinct I need to show that their images are distinct. So, if take two fellows b 1 and b 2 so, let us write like this I take b 1 and b 2 which are two different sub modules of m mod n and then I claim that their images are also distinct. So, look at pi inverse b 1 pi inverse b 2 the claim is that pi inverse b 1 is also not the same as pi inverse b 2. And in fact, this is uh, this is just a, a trivial fact about I mean we do not really need the fact that pi is a homomorphism or anything it is just a fact about set maps maps between sets. So, let me just give you a diagrammatic argument. So, if m uh, and m mod n I have a projection map pi just onto right the key point is that pi is an onto map and what i am doing is taking two different uh, subsets here i mean they are sub modules but let's just say they are subsets for now so just use two different colors so here are two different um, sub modules b1 and b2 okay, so here's b1 here's b2 and i claim that if b1 and b2 are not equal to each other then their inverse images their you know under pi inverse cannot be equal. Okay. Why is that? Well, observe that I am given b 1 not equal to b 2 means either there is an element in b 1 which is not in b 2 or there is an element in b 2 which is not in b 1. So, let us assume one of them. So, uh, this means that you know b 1 minus b 2 is not empty or b 2 minus b 1 is not empty. Okay. So, let us assume it is a former say 
uh, the first one. So let us pick an element x which is in b1 minus b2. Okay, so maybe not to confuse with the earlier x and so on, let me call it z. So z is actually a coset in this example because it is an element of m mod n. So let us take uh, z in uh, b1 minus b2 and observe that so if z is here uh, because pi is on 2, so I know that z must have some um, pre image, right. So let us um, call this pre image something. So let us look at there is an element x of m which must map to z. Okay. So since pi is on 2, there exists an element x in m such that pi of x maps to z. Now observe that this x is certainly in pi inverse of b1 because it is the inverse image of an element z in b1, but it is not in pi inverse b2, but x is not in pi inverse b2 because what is the definition of pi inverse b2? It is all elements of m which map to some element of b2, right? but in this case x is not, I mean x maps to z and z is not in b2. Okay. So, this shows that pi inverse b, we have produced an element in pi inverse b1 which is not in pi inverse b2. So, actually observe for this we, we did not really use anything about modules and so on. This is a general fact about uh, onto maps between two sets and their inverse images. Okay. So, this is the first part. The other part which I leave you to check. So, I have checked pi is 1 to 1, uh, check that pi is onto. again a straightforward verification. So, the, the result is worth remembering which finally says that submodules of a quotient are really nothing but submodules of m which contain n, okay, which lie between m and n in some sense. Okay, now, uh, let us do one last problem which sort of uses this uh, uh, submodules of a quotient business. So, here is a, uh, uh, so let, let me take a specific module. So, suppose I have z modulo some power of a prime. So, consider the following z modulo the ideal generated by a single element p power n and what is n here? Well, n is at least 1, p is a prime. So, this is an ideal. So, of course, it is a left ideal as well if you wish and uh, therefore, a sub module of z. Okay. So, think of this as a z module z mod p to the n is a z module. Okay, the claim is that uh, prove that z mod p to the n cannot be written cannot be written as the direct sum as the well the internal direct sum if you wish of two submodules of two non-zero submodules. So, everything here is a submodule uh, module over z. So, oh, two non-zero z submodules. Okay. So, in some sense it says you cannot split it into the direct sum of two, two submodules okay, with both non-zero. So, let us prove this. Um, so, first observation is that what we are dealing with is really a quotient module it is z modulo or something. So, it, it fits into the framework of the previous problem. So, let us call this m, let us call this n, they are both z modules, n is a sub module of m and what we are trying to do is to understand uh, whether we can decompose this guy into a direct sum of two sub modules, right. I want to see whether I can do this or not, okay. To do this, I need to understand what are the possible sub modules b1 and b2, right. What do sub modules of my quotient look like? If I can figure that out first, then I, I can then try and prove that you can never decompose in this way. So, the first step is to understand the submodules of m mod n and recall by the previous problem, we know what submodules of m mod n look like. Submodules of m mod n are really in bijection, you can think of them as uh, being in bijection with submodules of m, okay. m in this case is z containing n and n in this case is the ideal p power n or the sub module p power n. Okay. 
Okay, now let's uh, understand the right hand side. What do submodules of Z look like? So recall submodules of Z are really the ideals or the left ideals of Z. So what is a typical submodule? Well, Z remember is a PID, therefore all ideals are singly generated. So the submodules of Z are exactly the ideals generated by uh, just a single integer D. Okay, so uh, any submodule looks like this and we want to know when does this submodule contain the submodule p power n? Okay. Now, containment is again very easy to figure out for ideals in, in z as we have seen before. So, if I have an ideal a, it contains b, that is the same as saying that uh, one of them divides the other. right? So, which divides which? Well, if a contains b, then a divides b. Okay. So, this is for integers a and b. Okay, so what does that mean? So in our case, uh, therefore, we should say, so I had D uh, contains P power n means that D has to divide P power n. And we assumed that, well, P is a prime and so if I have a prime power, therefore, a divisor of a prime power has very few choices really. What can it look like? It is again a prime power p power m where the power m is a number between 0 and n. Okay, so, we are we have already um, understood quite a bit uh, what are the submodules of uh, uh, z modulo p to the n. They are just the submodules. So, on this side it is z modulo p to the n. The submodules are exactly submodules of the form p power m, you know, they are in, they are in bijection if you wish with submodules of the form p power n. Okay, so, so let us just write down that final conclusion. So, the submodules of z modulo p power n are therefore exactly, what are they? They are all the submodules, they are of the following form. So, take p power m and look at its quotient. Okay, where m. So, what is this? Another notation for this is what we used earlier pi of p power m, okay, uh, where pi is the projection map from z to So, all cosets of all elements coming from p power m and m is now a number between 0 and m. So, the submodules look exactly like this. Okay. Now, here is the interesting uh, observation. The submodules actually form uh, sort of a chain okay, with one contained in the other. Okay. So, that is the, the interesting thing with just having prime powers. So, the key observation here observe that uh, if I look at you know what do the submodules look like, I can look at pi of p power 0. So, there is p power 0 by p power n or p power 1 by p power n all the way till p power n by p, p power n. Okay, this is just the trivial submodule of the quotient if you wish and they are all contained one in the other in this way. This is the largest, this contains an x guy, this contains an x guy and so on. So, on this side is the 0 submodule and on this side this is the whole p power 0 is just z. So, this is z mod p power n. Okay, so, observe that all the submodules behave in the following way. Okay, the quotient module z mod p n has the 0 module and the full module, they are of course submodules, but every other submodule occurs as part of a chain which goes from the bottom to the top. Okay. In particular, what it says is that these b 1s and b 2s that I am looking for, right? so I am trying to say can I write this as some b 1 direct some b 2. Well, b1 and b2 but must both occur somewhere in this chain, right? If I could write it as b1 and b2, b1 must be one of them, b2 must be you know another, both occurring inside this chain. But observe that will mean that either b1 is contained in b2 or b2 is contained in b1, right? They both occur as part of this chain somewhere. So if b1 and b2 are any two non-zero submodules, if b1, b2 are non-zero submodules. The observation now is that 
of z mod p to the n then the observation is that either b1 is inside b2 or b2 is inside b1. Okay. In particular, it means that their intersection is not 0 because the intersection is one of them. It is either b1 or b2, whichever is smaller. right? And I have assumed I have two non-zero submodules. So, what does that mean? It means that uh, you know the uh, these two guys are not, are not independent in the sense that uh, you know, remember to say that the whole thing is a direct sum of these two, what I need is that their intersection must be 0 right? and their sum must give me the whole module. Now, in this case, uh, the intersection itself is not is not 0. Okay? So, this automatically proves that my whole module is definitely not, you know, it does not make sense to say that it is their internal direct sum at all. Okay? So, uh, uh, I mean, this is, this is again it demonstrates the utility of uh, trying to understand uh, submodules of a quotient in terms of modules of the ambient uh, module. Mm -hmm.